What's going on, y'all? Brad Stevens here for the very first episode of the RIC podcast, Really Important Conversations podcast. And today we had two very special guests from, from the Rise Up for Abortion Rights Organization, Jay Becker and Patricia, Wall- Patricia Wallen. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Brad. <laughs> How you doing? Good stuff. So uh, we'll find out more about Rise Up for Abortion Rights in just a minute. But I thought it'd be great to find out more, a little bit about you all. Just tell, tell, tell us a little bit about yourself. Legal abortion on demand. So uh, my name is Patricia, and I'm an abortion rights activist that has been, well, actually, because I was born in El Salvador, but I've been living in the U.S. for 20 years, 20 plus years. Um, so I've really been involved in what's going on with abortion rights in El Salvador. And now that I'm, you know, back to the U.S., I am uh, encounter these new, new problems that are going on in the in the U.S. with abortion rights. So that's why I'm, I'm here fighting for abortion rights again. From CBS News headquarters in New York. This is the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. Yeah, well, I'm born and bred Midwesterner, um, and I go back to the days before Roe. Good evening. In a landmark ruling, the Supreme Court today legalized abortions. The majority. Uh, I know from firsthand experience what it means when women do not have access to a, a legal and safe abortion when women do not have access to uh, birth control. Um, this uh, overturning, this stripping us half of the population of a basic civil right, it, it is the most devastating decision that ha- ever in the history of this country where an established right is revoked. Um, and and uh, in some ways, our, my generation knows what that means. And in other ways, it's it's so much worse. Uh, the impact of this, I know we're going to be getting into this more, but um, there's just no way that I could sit back and and not uh, be doing everything that I can to, to sound the alarm and bring people into the streets, uh, which is the only way we ever got any of these rights in the first place. Now, there are planned rallies by pro-abortion rights protesters in New York, in Chicago, in L.A., and here in Washington, D.C., and they've drawn large crowds. You know, I was telling Patricia before uh, we signed on that um, when the decision first went down, I was I donated to Planned Parenthood. I started getting back involved with Indivisible, contacted my Congress people. I volunteered with uh, NARA organization. And then I was saying, I was looking at different protests. I just kept seeing like this green, like t- green t-shirts, green bandanas, and it didn't register what was, you know, who, who you were. And then I started seeing stuff popping up on Facebook and on YouTube. And then it, I said, oh, okay, rise up for abortion rights. And that's when I started finding out more about you all. So for those who don't know, tell us more about uh, rise up for abortion rights and how the movement started. Really after the Supreme Court, um, heard the arguments in Dobbs on December 1st, it was um, stunningly clear that they were giving uh, value to a a clump of cells, a fetal personhood over women. And I I mean, I felt like listening to it, like I'd been punched in the gut. Um, It was very clear this was a disaster in the making. And yet nobody was saying anything. Uh, Planned Parenthood was uh, uh, telling us to uh, elect better Democrats and give them money, Um, which funding abortion is important, but it's not a strategy that was going to stop this disaster. So um, people who had seen this coming came together on on January 22nd, the anniversary of Roe, uh, Rise Up for Abortion Rights was founded. Uh, by Merle Hoffman, who um, is my generation, uh, founded one of the first legal abortion providers in New York City. She's very well known, an author. Um, She founded it, Lori Sokol, who's the editor of eWomen's News, and um, Sansara Taylor, who's one of the co-hosts of the RNL show, the Revolution Nothing Less show. Uh, They came together and uh, issued a statement and 
was joined by some very important and well-known people like Roya Steinem and Eve Ensler, and uh, now known as V, um, and, and launched this really all-volunteer <laughs> grassroots organization because we knew uh, electing Democrats relying on them to ensure our rights is part of why we are in the mess we are in. Oh, I mean, we can get into that, but over and over again, they've promised us Obama promised when he was running the first time they would codify Roe. He did nothing. He changed his priorities. When they could have, they didn't. And they blame us. They're lecturing women about you should vote for more Democrats. No, we should be flooding the streets. Well, Patricio can talk about how the women in Latin America have won rights that we are losing. Um, but that's where Rise Up for Abortion Rights started. And I'm really proud of what we accomplished. Uh, reading walkouts in schools and uh, high schools and colleges and bringing people out into the streets, not anywhere where it needed to be. Uh, you know, it's hard to go from zero to maxing out in, in a matter of weeks. Uh, but uh, we certainly have made green um, a color associated with abortion around the country. So that's we've existed for barely over six months. But we begin in Poland, where a strict anti-abortion law introduced earlier this year has been blamed for the death of a 30-year-old woman. The you know, I've been hearing like a lot of stories, doing, like, doing more research, and they had like a case in, in uh, Poland where a woman wanted an abortion, and she tried to come to the States, and a water broke because she needed an abortion to save her life, and they were hesitant to do it, and she passed away. And I know you mentioned you were from El Salvador, Patricia. I was just reading a case uh, last week where a woman had a miscarriage. And then they sentenced, her, they sentenced her to 50 years in jail. And I know that some people are like, well, that's, that's there. But to me, that's like a bad horror movie. That's coming to a state near you quick, fast, in a hurry. But what, what is the fight like in El Salvador for people fighting for reproductive rights? What is that fight like? Yeah, well, uh, in Latin America, you know, societies, they're, uh, they're very religious countries. Uh, either Catholic or evangelical, you know, so uh, abortion has always been uh, prohibited, but there are countries in Latin America that will respect at least um, some circumstances. For example, like when the life of a woman is in danger, they will allow abortions. Uh, when a woman has had a stillbirth, you know, they won't, um, convict her of any crime um, and obstetrical problems, you know, they, they will allow an abortion for a woman, but the situation for El Salvador is one of the few countries uh, like Honduras in Latin America and Dominican Republic in Latin America. Um, they're the same as El Salvador that those circumstances that I, like I mentioned, they will not respect even those. So abortion is a hundred percent and completely criminalized. So they, you know, there are women, like you said, right now in, in prison, this moment that have been serving, serving sentences for 10, 15 years in, in prison that they've been convicted of uh, murder, actually, because they get eight years in prison for uh, abortions, even when what they had was were miscarriages, you know, because that's the problem of restrictive abortion laws that it get it can get so confusing. So women that go to the hospitals having miscarriages can be convicted of um inducing their own abortions. And so they end up in prison. And once in prison, what they do is they change their charges to murder. So they end up getting 30 to 50 years in prison. So that's the reality of, of the, the country right now, the same as in Honduras and Dominican Republic. They do not um, allow any uh, exceptions for abortion. You're listening to the R.I.C. Podcast. Really important conversations. Will the state of South Dakota going forward force a 10-year-old in that very same situation to have a baby? What I would say is I don't believe a tragic situation should be perpetuated by another tragedy. 
And so there's more that we've got to do to make sure that we really are living a life that says every life is precious, especially innocent lives. You, you know, I shouldn't, uh, I shouldn't be, my, my mind shouldn't be boggled by this point in time, but like the hypocrisy, like I was reading that every year 8,000 people die waiting for organ transplants in the States. But yet and still, if the government said, well, we're gonna force you to see if you're a match, then we're gonna pull out your kidney where you like it or not, give it to somebody else. There would be riots in the street that would make January 6th look like, look like a picnic. So it's like the hypocrisy just is mind boggling Maybe it should not be at this point in time. And I know that women and people who give birth are at the front of these attacks, but this is a everybody, this is a everybody issue, right? Why is it also important for men, primarily cisgender men to be involved as well? I can I can tell you my my opinion, my first opinion when I hear this question is because the same as women, you know, men also benefit from abortions. I I had friends, you know, that it's actually the men who, you know, is wanting their girlfriends, wives to have an abortion and they benefit the same way as women benefit from stopping a pregnancy that they are not ready for that they don't want uh so it's an issue that affects both men and women so that's my first reaction how about you jay what do you want when do you want it what do you want when do you want it there's so many different levels it's basic um civil rights how can you stand back if you were out on the streets for when george floyd was um, murdered in front of us, then you should be out in the streets for this. This is everyone. And, and, and this is also, uh, Patricia was uh, pointing to, this is our, our most intimate lives. You know, when, when you decide, yes, I want to have a, a, a child, that's a wonderful thing. But to have one when you can't take care of it, when, when it could uh, ruin your, your own health, um, it, it I, you know, I, I, I don't know if you, I'm sure you know Alice Walker. Uh, she has a short story collection that came out in uh, the mid-70s called In Love and Trouble. That was a time that for uh, my generation, In Love and Trouble meant you were pregnant and you didn't know what to do. It was going to ruin your life. Um, people may know uh, Bruce Springsteen, The River. You know, she found, he found out she was pregnant and man, that's all she wrote. That was the end of it. That was the end of, you know, get your union card, go to work. That was the end of whatever dreams you thought because you had no choice. You were, uh, uh, and that's, that's from the men's perspective. <laughs> Women drop out of school. You get kicked out of school. Back in the day, you, if you were pregnant in high school, you, it, the girl would get kicked out. You were not allowed to come to school. The boy could keep going to school. The girl, that was the end of it. You're not going to go to college. You were going to be raising a, a baby when you were barely out of childhood yourself. It's just devastating to women's futures. And it also makes women very dependent on men. You, you know, back in the day, you, you go for a job. Well, how do I know you're not going to get pregnant? And then I have to hire somebody else. It's, right. it's, it, it, it really is women being second class citizens through life. Uh, and and it, it's part of the whole agenda of the Republican fascist party. That's all they are. It's, it's male supremacy, violent male supremacy, violent white supremacy and anti-foreigner. This is this is their program. And, and, and abortion is really a battering ram to that whole program. It's like you were saying about is it's, it's in a country near you and it's coming here right now. I mean, there was a, a woman in. Uh, not coincidentally, Texas, near the border, who was uh, put in jail on suspected abortion. It, it wasn't even a crime, but that's what they're setting up. And eventually there was, we had protests. What was that in, in May, Patricia? Yeah, May 14th. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and uh, there was such an outcry that they let her go. But there are women around the country in Indiana, Oklahoma, Texas, who have been sentenced to years in prison for allegedly uh, self-aborting. Now, already, before Dobbs was over. So this, this, is just, uh, this is just a disaster. Justice Thomas today in his concurrence spelled out the rights that he wants thrown out next beyond abortion. Now that they've taken care of Roe, he wants Griswold, Lawrence, and Obergefell, in his words, reconsidered. And 
And we know Clarence Thomas put it right out there. Um, he wants to re-examine uh, the, the decisions that uh, legalized gay marriage, that legalized birth control. I mean, I remember when you had to be married or in some states or at least over 21 to get birth control, okay? You want to talk about ruining your sex life? Yeah. Um, and, and even the laws that used what they called sodomy laws that prohibited same-sex sexual relations in the privacy of your bedroom. This is what these people are going after. And oh, and, and birth control. Every single major anti-abortion organization in this country is opposed to birth control. That is on, in their crosshairs. So if we don't rise up and stop this, that is where we're headed. Now is the time. The church is supposed to direct the government. The government is not supposed to direct the church. That is not how our founding fathers intended it. You know, uh, me and one of my uh, friends had like a discussion about this before the, before the decision went down. She's very much pro-life. And so I think, uh, you know, who knows, our friendship may be kind of on the rocks right now, but she was saying how, uh, you know, oh, there's plenty of money out there. You know, it hardly happens somebody has a baby or they get sexually assaulted, so on and so forth. And then she, I was mentioning how it's a slippery slope with same-sex marriage. She was like, well, you're not gay anyway. It's what difference make. And it's like the kind of thing that when somebody, when you mention fascism and authoritarianism and theocracy, some people are like, oh, you overreact. Not a big deal. La potenza marittima di Cartagine. And the reality being is that, not to go to my soapbox, but Nazi Germany didn't start off Nazi Germany. Uh, Mussolini in Italy didn't start off Mussolini in Italy. Sometimes it happens, and it happens in plain sight. And the mentality, well, it's not a big deal, it does not impact me. And then it's not a big deal till it's a big deal, right? And, and I love like uh, hearing some of the messages you all are saying about uh, nonviolence, civil disobedience, and the importance of it being uh, sustained. What's the importance of making sure we, like you say, take it to the streets to stand for our rights? Because I feel it is a very slippery slope to a fascist rule by minority state. What's the importance of making sure you're in the street for your voices to be heard? Breaking news. I mean, I can I can say that the inspiration that Rise Up for Abortion is always talking about comes from the women in that have been fighting for their right to abortion in Latin America. We have seen, you know, how they didn't have the right, so they had started to take to the streets and demand the right. We're here to stay and we are not going anywhere until the Supreme Court restores the right to legal ab abortion all across the nation. And, you know, this is where the green color was born too, the green bandana. They, women in Argentina started wearing the green bandana and they started coming out to the streets in hundreds and thousands and millions demanding their right. And they did it tirelessly, they didn't stop. They would do it and do it again until it was just so out of control because they would come out in millions and not stop. Early this morning, Argentina became the first major Latin American country to legalize abortion. It was a dramatic victory for grassroots groups that have been organizing for years. But and so the government the had to finally, you know, give the right for abortion. And that's the inspiration that we have, because if right now in the U.S., when we heard about what they were planning to do to overturn Roe, this is why we knew we had to take a stand and show that we're not OK with what they're planning to do. And now that they did overturn Roe, we, even more, we have to take to the streets to, you know, let them know that we're not OK with this decision. And this is why we call people to take to the streets, because like Jay was saying, none of the rights that have ever been won were won by asking nicely and, and ask, you know, they were won by fighting for them. They were won by taking to the streets and demanding and, and 
protesting. You know, even the right to vote was won by fighting. And there were many people, you know, protesting, throwing to jail. They try to do everything to stop the riots. But no, it's not how you win rights, actually, not by voting either. So this is why we keep saying, you know, look at the women in other countries that have not stopped fighting for for their rights to actually get them. You're listening to the R.I.C. podcast. Really important conversations. It's summertime in Chicago. The weather's beautiful outside. Uh, winter's going to be coming. I'm not looking forward to winter. <laughs> but how, how, how is the civil disobedience going to change up, like the movement, when it starts getting cold and people may not want to uh, take to the streets? Like, is it going to change up more indoors? How, how is that uh, uh, going to change up tactically? Let's see. Uh, but everything has to do with what we do now. I mean, this, this right now, July, is really a vital time. Um, we can't allow this atrocity, as Sansara Taylor has rightly said, we cannot allow this atrocity to get normalized. Like, as you were talking about, like, oh, calm down, you're overreacting. No, people have been telling us that since we started, you're overreacting. Oh, we have the medication abortion now, that'll take care of it. No, actually, they are forbidding that. They are Republican fascists in these state legislators are passing laws to um, criminalize people helping women get what they need to, uh, to get across the state line, contributing money. They are trying, they are criminalizing everything having to do with a woman controlling your, our reproduction, anyone who can get pregnant controlling their reproduction. And Right now, we even have a Democratic Party that is more interested in bipartisanship and reaching across the aisle to these fascists than they are in standing up for our rights. So we're in actually a more um, fraught situation. I mean, I'm sure your listeners are aware of the January 6th committee hearings. Trump is guilty as hell. He was directing it. We just saw it. uh, yesterday, more direct evidence. What is happening? He is not being prosecuted. Nothing. This is just feeding the fires. His base looks at that and go, well, if it was that serious, why isn't he being prosecuted? It, 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 this, this is a disaster. They have, uh, uh, they're conciliating and collaborating with them. And that's what we're up against. That's why uh, even more so we cannot rely on on the Democratic Party uh, elections in November. I'm that's that. Forget that. That's part of the problem. We have to we we have to step up, and if that means we have to change, we want to change the world. We have to change ourselves and find that courage and find that community and and take to the streets. Yes, I wanted to add to the. Um you know, like you're you're saying that you you know the summer's over. How is it going to be for for the winter time? And this is you know we have been calling for nonviolent civil disobedience, and this is where we get even more creative when the winter time comes and we can't be out on the streets for a long time. But um, you you're gonna have to wait and see what we have in store because <laughs> this is the great part you know the everything is uh, you know dance for abortion rights sing for abortion rights pain for abortion rights we've been doing that even in the, in the summertime so you you're just gonna have to wait and see what's gonna be you know we get creative and we invite people to get creative and express their their opinion, you know, in any way they can. Uh, you know, I'm not even a big Star Star Wars fan, but sometimes, like, when you when you see something happening, and it's like it feels like it's so overwhelming, like man, like the eyes, it feels like you know you're taking on the Empire. You're like this this <laughs> ragtag group of rebels trying to fight again. It can feel overwhelming. But it got me thinking about one of my favorite movies, Shawshank Redemption with Morgan Freeman. He had this line, no hope, no nothing, right? So in the midst of these dark times, why is it important to maintain hope in the midst of the fight? Stay in the streets. Stay in the streets. Wait, 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 I can't hear you guys in the back. Get in the streets. 
Yeah, I, I love that question. It, it's it's really true. Um, the 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 revcoms, the revolutionary communist revcom us. They talk about hope on a scientific basis. You have to have hope based on really understanding the, what you're up against and what you've got in your corner. And I think what we've got in our corner is exactly what we've been talking about. This is an atrocity that impacts half of the population directly. And now we ha- we know it's not us saying, oh, they're going to do this. They're, they're telling us. So wake up. That's the hope. I mean, when we were out just again on Saturday, yeah, we are a ragtag group and we're marching down the street in Chicago and people are applauding. People are jumping. We say, join us, join us and they join. Um, and so we have to say, and they're, oh, we're with you. Okay, with us, then you have to get active. Get in the streets. Get in the streets. And stay in the streets. Get in the streets. Get in the streets. Stay in the streets. And stay in the streets. Stay in the streets. Yes. Um, the sidewalks into the streets. <laughs> we chant. And, 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 uh, and that's hope. Uh, because uh, we do represent the interests and, the, and, and in many cases, the felt needs of millions and millions of people. But they have to know that there is a way to act and that this is the only way takes our own action, our own struggle our own, that's going to um, reverse this disaster. Because, there, you know, there's a lot of people, a lot of misleadership out there. That is misdirecting people and trying to, like you're, you were saying, calm down, you're overreacting. <laughs> no, just listen to them. So it has to be hope on a scientific basis. And I, I think there's every reason to hope. Because as we change ourselves, we can, we can change history. It's, you know, I, I'm sure you're aware of Frederick Douglass. You, know, you don't get the crops without the thunderstorm and the rain. Yeah, sure, sure. Mm-hmm. And, 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 you know, I just uh, last summer I was reading the biography of Frederick Douglass and it's it's so freaking inspiring. They went through it. Where did they get hope? Yeah, yeah, I can say from my my part, you know, we see a lot of hope in our protest, in our walkouts from every generation. We see the people that were fighting for you know, in the 70s and like Jay's generation, for example, we see them out there too protesting, you know, for the right that we lost. And I think that, you know, people are getting educated and in, in, in interested and they want to find out, they want to know. And the younger generations are joining the fight. And that's really hopeful because, you know, we are uniting against, you know, the forces that are trying to just hurt us. And it's very hopeful to see women across the world uniting for the same, you know, reason. There's women, we've been talking to women in Spain, in El Salvador, in Argentina, in Mexico, Colombia, in Poland, in London. France. Um, they had in, a protest in, France, in Paris. In France, in Sweden, you know, and they're talking to us and we're uniting. And that, you, you know, that is hope. You know, that is hope. And the more that we keep uniting and fighting and, you know, we, we'll get to where women deserve to be. Good stuff, good stuff. Great, 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 great. So, hey, that's been the first episode of the RIC with Patricia Wallen and Jay Becker. So if people want to find out more about Rise Up for Abortion Rights, where can they find out more information? It's the website. It's uh, Rise Up, number four. So riseupabortionrights.org. Okay. And we're on Instagram, Rise Up for Abortion Rights. We're on uh, TikTok. We're on Facebook and Twitter. And we also have Chicago um, uh, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook accounts. So people follow us and build this movement. It's our, our, all of our futures are on the line. Good stuff. Good stuff. Right. Good stuff. So until next time, Brad Stevens saying, 
Hey, as always, no hope, no nothing. Keep up the good fight. Until next time, we'll talk to you soon. Peace. Thank you. Thank you.